town In that Texas town About to check outside the games And you know what I'm talking about Just let me know if you wanna go To that home out on the range They got a lot of nice girls As you can see, we had a phenomenal weekend last weekend at Nakomi. It's our fall retreat annually for the student ministry. It's a couple hours east of here. And actually, this was the 40th year that Advent Youth Ministry has gone to Nakomi. So since 1983, Advent's been taking our youth to Nakomi for our fall retreat. And uh, with such a significant number like 40, uh, it was a commensurately significant weekend. God is gracious, and he is good, and he is uh, always at work. And I was inspired by this amazing group of students that went this weekend, uh, and the leaders as well, by their love for Jesus, their love for one another. If you ever find yourself down or discouraged about the next generation, if you ever find yourself fearful about the future, I challenge you, spend some time with this group of students and with God for a weekend, and your hopes as well will be renewed. Uh, Before we open God's word, let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. May we be changed just a little bit to be more like Christ, living fearlessly for you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Isaiah 41.10 says this. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All of us walked in this morning carrying fears with us. And for all of us with fears, that is some really good news. While we think fear is what is with us and constantly with us, that is not always true. God is with us. And when we remember that God is with us, we can fear not. Fear not is used 365 times in the Bible. 365 times the Lord tells us, do not fear. One for every day of the year. February 29th, every four years, you're allowed to fear biblically. There's no, (laughs) do not fear that day. But every other day, God says, do not fear because God is with us. See, fear has been common to the human condition since the fall, since the beginning. After Adam and Eve sinned and ushered sin and death into the world by disobeying God, Adam's first recorded words were, I was afraid and I hid. And that's what we've been doing ever since. We fear and we hide. Fear is a strange and powerful thing. It has a very real effect in our lives. Uh, I'm a big soccer fan, and today the World Cup begins right now as the first match. And so I have to share a little soccer trivia with you all. Uh, At the end of a game, if it's still tied, they go to something called a penalty kick shootout. And in a PK shootout, uh, they found that if a, if a guy is taking a, if a person is a player is taking a kick to l- not lose the game, they will make that kick 62% of the time. So if they miss, they lose, they'll only make that 62% of the time. If they're taking a kick to win the game, they'll make that 92% of the time. The fear of losing is powerful. It's greater than any freedom we find in victory. Fear has a very real effect on the way we live our lives. Fear, we all know it really well. It's been common to each and every one of us. But if we're honest, I don't think we like it. I'll bet if I offered you a a pill that could take away your fears forever, you might think about taking it this morning. But at the same time, and this is what makes fear strange, we grip our fears tightly As I think about the fears in my life, there are fears that I don't want to let go of, and yet I hate them at the same time. We make so many decisions based on fear, from whom we talk to, to what we wear, uh, 
we have given fear the steering wheel of our lives in a lot of ways. Our culture knows this. This is what advertisements are based on. There's so many advertisements based on fear. You better get this or people will reject you. Social media is based on fear. Don't miss out. Don't be lonely. You have to be afraid of those things. Parents can use it in parenting. Teachers and friends, even church leaders from time to time can use fear to drive our decisions rather than faith, hope, and love. And when fear gets the steering wheel of our lives, fear buckles up and grips tightly and can take us in so many different directions. With the steering wheel, fear can drive us to to anger. At the root of anger is fear. It can drive us to anxiety and worry. The root of those things is fear and depression and joyless living. It can drive us to hatred. The root of hatred is, is fear. It can drive us to bad decisions. See, I like to think I'm pretty fearless. I, think to, I like to think I'm pretty courageous, especially in the eyes of my little children. I'm pretty courageous to them. But as I thought about this passage and thought about my life, I realized I can be quite fearful even in ways that I don't uh, fully recognize. And when I am, it robs me of my joy, my joy in life, my joy in relating to God, my joy in relating to others how badly we want to break out of fearful living and find freedom to live freely, to live alive. And that's why we need some good news, like Isaiah 41.10, fear not, for I am with you. We need good news like that, that can, that can break our fears, that can uh, conquer our fears, that can face our fears for us and put them back in their proper place. See, God wants us to live fearlessly. He tells us to fear not, and he's given us the good news of Jesus Christ that can reimagine those fears. You see, God has taken on our fears in Christ in a very radically powerful way. Because Jesus died for us, because Jesus rose for us, because Jesus went through our fears for us, all of our fears are reimagined and and stripped of their power and put back in their rightful place place in our lives. So this year at Nokomi, we talked about this. We talked about fearless and fearless living. We let God's word and the good news of Christ conquer our fears, take on our fears, our top 10 fears with 10 different speakers about those fears. And each of these 10 talks, I like to picture them as like the laps of the Israelites around the walls of Jericho. With each talk, with each lap, a stone is wobbled from its place in our fearful lives. And God is slowly picking apart the foundation of our fears. And when our walls of fear come down, when God tears those walls down, we can then live as children of God, free and alive. So that's what I want to share with you all this morning. I brought clips from Nakomi back to you all of 10 different speakers addressing ten, top 10 fears in our lives. And as you hear them, I want you to think about where you can relate to them. And I'm hoping that the fears in your lives are dismantled as well just a little bit more today because of our fear facing God. I want to propose an idea to you. It's one that's so simple that we often miss out on it. What if there's no such thing as ordinary? What if we were looking so hard for these great experiences of significance that we are missing out on the opportunities for significance right in front of us? What if there's no such thing as ordinary when you follow an extraordinary God? First of all, we have to believe that we are special to God. Everything of importance in this life begins with God, not us. We spend too much time looking for someone or certain people to make us feel special. This desire to be special is not wrong, but this desire to be special will never be truly filled if we don't realize that first and foremost, we are special to God. No one who is called in Christ is insignificant in the eyes of God, not even me. With that truth being fully known in my heart, I'm free to be insignificantly significant. Why should I strive to be significant in their eyes or in your eyes or even in my own eyes? when I'm already eternally, eternally significant to him. Psalm 139 says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. So you and I are special to God because he created us. 
In another passage in the Bible, Micah wrote, Bethlehem, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be a ruler over Israel for me. Micah prophesied that the Messiah would come from Bethlehem to rule on behalf of God himself. And in choosing Bethlehem as the birthplace of the future king, God shows how he delights in bestowing significance upon the insignificant. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest with me. I want to tell you about some characters in the Bible. You know, everybody knows about Moses. He's a pretty good dude, right? He's significant in, uh, in, in God's eyes. But he argued with God. They were at the burning bush. And what I like about the whole story is he's, he's, he's got a flock of sheep that he's working with. And he goes up to this burning bush and God starts speaking to him. Said, hey, I need you to help my people in Egypt. I need you to get these guys out, and, and I need you to do that. And he argues with God and says, I can't do that. I have a speech impediment. I don't like to talk to people. But yet God kept pushing him. And you know what he said? God said to Moses, I will be with you. You don't have to worry. I'm going to be by your side. I'm going to be your partner right here. But I need somebody to talk to Pharaoh. Trust in God. Boast in God. And hope in God. This leaves one legitimate FOMO that I think we should all like be mindful of. But I, don't, I would hope no one in this room has to worry about. And that is the fear of unbelief and missing out eternally. Right? But it's, it's easily defeated. Very easily defeated. Um, if you have faith and believe in Jesus Christ, then your one legitimate fear is gone, and the chains of FOMO in your life have been decisively broken forever. FOMO should now be dead for you. In Christ, the sting of missing out is eternally gone. This is one of the promises of the gospel that drives needy FOMO-plagued sinners to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, in him is the promise of no loss eternally. All that has been lost will be found in him, and all that we have missed will be summed up in him. The wealthy man in Jesus' parable paints a portrait of the greatest tragedy in this life. In the rich man's life, he grabs and grabs and fills his arms and fills his belly and fills his life with pleasures. He grabs everything but Christ. Right? He was God-ignoring and filled his life with everything but what his soul truly needed, which was worship. In this condition of unbelief, the rich man now suffers the most dreaded missing out. It's an eternal missing out. For those in Christ, eternity will make up for every loss that you ever suffered in this momentary life. The biblical doctrine of heaven proves it. Heaven is the restoration of everything broken by sin in this life. Heaven is the reparation of everything you lost in this life. Heaven is the reimbursement of everything you missed out on in this life. Poor Lazarus learned the blessed truth. Heaven is God's eternal response to all of the FOMOs of this life. Heaven will restore every missing out a thousand times over and over again throughout all of eternity. L listen to this passage. This is Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 6. It says, You see that just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And that's you. Paul's talking about you, the ungodly. And then Paul wants to clarify that. Very, very rarely will anyone uh, die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. 
Then he goes on, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Like that's the way that God loves you. While you were still messed up, broken, worthless, God died, Christ died for you. And he died for the person next to you. And he died for the person that, that seems to have messed up values. And he, and he died for the person that, that is a, a real outsider. And he died for the person that's a, a total outcast. And he, he died for the person that just seems like a total jerk. And somebody that seems like, man, they, they don't live life the right way. And, and, and he died for the person that really just feels mean. And I, I don't want to interact with them. But you see, God died for each one of them. And the value that, that we see in them is the value that God has given them. You've never met a person that wasn't a beloved daughter or son of God. And when we start seeing things that way, it begins to change our perspective. And we recognize that we are called to love the way that God loved us. To see people with God's eyes and find a way to reach out past our fear and begin to love because they are the beloved of God as well. So the future is unknown, and sometimes it might be scary, but God knows, and as Christians, we all know how it ultimately turns out. Revelations 22.12. Behold, I am coming to you. My reward is is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. We know how this turns out, guys. I've made some significant mistakes in my life, uh, bad decisions. And even when I wasn't aware, God was for me. He protected me. He molded me into the vessel that I needed to be to fulfill the purpose that he has for me in his vast, incomprehensible upper plan and a plan that includes you. So what's scarier here is where I may have ended up without God. And for what it's worth, I'm facing one of my greatest fears right now in this very moment which is fear of not being worthy or wise enough to talk about God's words to others. So we don't know what the future holds or where it's going to take us. It is only known by God. So have peace in that. And the Lord gives us that peace and the certainty that if we follow him and his commandments, we will have a life full of joy and blessings, a life that's better than we imagined because everything will be according to his perfect plan. When I read those words, I felt such care and love for God that it shifted how I had seen rejection my whole life. I'm going to tell you, you're going to be rejected in life over and over and over again. It's just a reality. Um, even as followers of God, um, following Jesus, like Jesus was rejected, but he still did what God called him to do. And so you're going to, you're going to be rejected. Jesus says, in this world, you're going to have trouble but I have overcome the world. And so as you experience that rejection, instead of it letting it um, uh, beat you up and beat you down so that you just feel like you can't go forward in life, allow it to be transformative to you. I think about how that boy rejecting me made me feel like I need to say yes to this, this other guy. He probably needed that. He was not someone that people rallied around and loved on and cared for. But he got to go to the dance with a girl. Um, and I think that was important in Jesus' mind. If I had um, hung out with all those popular kids and, and not been rejected by them, I probably would have gotten involved with drugs and alcohol and maybe not followed what God had f for me in life. And when my world felt like it fell apart when I, when I lost that job, I pushed into the scriptures. I pushed into what God had for me. And the next job was even better. 
And the things that came out of that next job were amazing. So I want to say to you, as you think about the fear of rejection, is instead of leaning away from it and trying to avoid it and not um, engage with humans, engage with people. Know that you're going to be rejected at some point in time. But if we don't take that risk, then God can't use you in the ways that he's called you. He can't transform you in the ways that you're called to be transformed. So take the opportunity to lean in and do not be afraid. The fact of the matter is that we live in a really lonely world. Did you guys know that one in every five Americans are quote unquote lonely? That's a lot if you think about it. <laughs> More than half of all Americans feel alone and left out. Why is being alone so terrible and perceived as a negative time in our life? Fear of loneliness can sneak into our daily lives and make us feel insignificant when we do not have people to surround us with to feel complete. Not only does this disconnect us from the world, but it can create a bad habit of disconnecting us from the word and seeing what God really has in store for us. Know that God loves you. You are so loved that while we were still sinners, he came to die for us. Even his disciples ran. Jesus died alone by himself. He knows you, and despite all of your brokenness and unworthiness, Jesus laid down his life for you. If you are ever at a time in your life where you're just suffering and you're miserable from fearing that you are all by yourself, Think about Jeremiah and his story. God is with you always. God tells us in Deuteronomy 31.8, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. How powerful is that? Never. 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 Um, <laughs> even through our mistakes and trials, God loves you, and nothing you can do or will do um, will make him leave you alone. Imagine if we could live a life without fear of loneliness. How much easier would it be to find the purpose that God has for our lives? We wouldn't have to fill up our schedules and stay busy to avoid being alone. We could leave freely without the fear of loneliness. God has the power to free us from our fears, but rather than removing our fear of disapproval, he typically frees us by helping us face our false fears so that they lose their power over us. No individual can live without interactions with other humans. We cannot help but derive our identity, our value, and our meaning from external sources. Additionally, by instinct, we seek them from external personal sources. You have no Deep down, they are bestowed on us by a person. The person or persons whose reward of approval we desire the most, whose curse of disapproval we most fear to receive, is the person or persons we will obey, our functional God, so to speak. That's why the Bible so often commands us to fear the Lord. I'll give you two examples. Deuteronomy chapter 10 Verses 12 and 13, Moses says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statues of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. And in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus says, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Both Moses and Jesus command us to love God supremely, and both of them command us to fear God supremely. They are not mutually exclusive commands. They are two sides of the same coin. If we fear and love God, then we can, through God, overcome the fear of man. Some people are so scared of dying that they forget to live, and sometimes that even are alive. Sometimes we give in to the anxiety and despair, or sometimes it causes us to make dumb decisions. Think about all the times you were tempted to make a bad choice because you're afraid of death. I know for me, 
when I think about all the times I was tempted to do something wrong because I was afraid of death and was around the corner, and I would regret it if I didn't do it. And even more than that, when I'm afraid of dying, I forget that there is someone bigger than death. I forget about God. Because of the root of fear of death is the lie that death is final. But we all have experienced a Christian funeral of a loved one where everyone is reminding everyone that is a lie. Death is not final. Like in the Bible, King David had so many times in his life where he was afraid of death. But God's presence put the fear of death in its place. He writes about it in Psalm. Y'all know Psalm 23, 4. It says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear no evil, for you are with me. The way God conquered this fear is by sending Jesus to go through the valley of the death. And when he rose from the dead, he gave us eternal life. John 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. So death is not final. God has promised, God has promised us all life after death. This is how death goes from something terrible to the doorway to greater life. And that, y'all, is nothing to fear. This is God. He's not safe. God is not safe. He's an all-consuming fire, as the Bible describes him. He is, as Matthew 10 says, the only one who can destroy your body and your soul in hell. That's God. That's who God is. Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. So my, my plea for you this morning is don't tame God. A tame God can do nothing about your fears. A tame God has no power over your fears. Don't tame him by not fearing him. But am I really trying to say that you should be terrified of God? That we should fight, flee, or freeze in our fear of God? We should just shake in fear when we go to church? No. This is a completely different fear. A fear that's reimagined because of Christ. The gospel reorders the fear of God. See, we've said it in our gospel liturgy all weekend. Jesus, God the Son, absorbs all the wrath of God on the cross. God is the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell, and Christ went through that for us. All these things we're afraid of, Christ went through for us. Out of love, Christ is forsaken. Christ is rejected. Christ is alone. Christ is missing out. He's exposed. He is dead for us. And then he opens the door for us to know him and to have new life in him with his resurrection. So then, now, think about it. The fear of God is not terrifying. We're not shaking in our boots kind of fear. Instead, the fear of God is the fear of not being near him. We don't fear being near God. We fear being far from him because the all-powerful God is also our Savior. I'm so thankful for these incredible speakers shining the light of God's word. They were amazing this weekend, and I particularly think that last one is, is really good looking, but... <laughs> They, uh, they were awesome, and I love to see God's word uh, shine on the hearts of students and strongholds of fear dismantled. I hope that you got that sense this morning as well by God's, uh, by God's word and good news uh, being presented to re- towards your fears, by the light of Christ shining on your fears. Perhaps the, the, the grip of fear that you walked in with now feels escapable, now feels like it's, it's running away, now feels like it's in its proper place. Fear can show up in our lives in so many ways. But I hope not anymore. Not because the light of Christ has shone on our hearts. For me, one of my greatest fears is the fear of losing control. And that's there in every fear. The fear of losing control. And I wear these shackles of that fear all the time. I live with such a fear of that and yet I can be blind to it. See, I think that fearing gives me control. I tell myself a lie. 
Maybe you've found this lie in any of these fears that resonated with you this morning. The lie that fear is necessary. Fear can be a good thing. It can be a right thing. We survive because we fear certain things. But sometimes we start to say, well, so I, I should fear this. I can have a little control over this by fearing it. And then it starts slowly. It starts to creep in. You don't even recognize it. You start to say, well, I have a healthy and appropriate amount of fear about this. And then you say, well, it's a, it's a very important thing, so I should, it's very important that I should fear it. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, uh, maybe I should be fearing this more. Until it's finally like, well, if I don't fear this, then who will? And we start to tell ourselves the lie, and slowly fear moves from the back seat to the middle seat, and from the middle seat up to the passenger seat, and finally from the passenger seat to the driver's seat, fear buckles in, grabs the steering wheel, and I find myself in the back seat as fear is driving my life. Fear is a, a trap. It's a, it's a bait and switch. It will draw you in and then ruin your life, because fear makes us think we have control, right? You think the more fear you have about something, the more control you have about it. When really it's not that at all. The more fear you have about something, the more control fear has over that thing. We become fear's slave. But no more walking in darkness. The light of the gospel has shone on our hearts and the darkness of our fears no more walking in darkness, no more plodding along in slavery to fear. God loves you too much for you to walk in fear, for fear to drive your life. I encourage you to see and savor the gospel. Preach yourself the good news. Remind yourself daily of the good news. Shine the light of Christ on your fears and watch them flee. Because the most fearful being in the entire universe, the fear that's bigger than all of your other fears, is your God. And he loves you. He has redeemed you. He's reimagined your fears and put them back in their proper places. So, so go from this place with the good news of the gospel, shining light on your fears. Go forth from this place and live fearless. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we beg for your word and your good news to wash over us so that our fears might run, so that our fears might give up control in our lives. Face our fears for us, God. And remind us that we are your children, that you are with us. God, daily would you give us a, a clear glimpse and sure reminder of your love and that foundation that we walk upon because there is no room for fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear, says 1 John 4, 18. And so would you continually be casting out our fear with your love for us. May we fear no more, live fearlessly for you. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.